It's great to be with you this morning, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Uh, my name is Doug Ullman, and I like to start by saying I have the best job in the world. How many here are retired? After you, I have the best job in the world. How many are tired? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> no, uh, but you know what I get to do as a photographer? I get to drive around the back roads of Minnesota, and for the past 18 years, I've been doing it full time, exploring our history. And yes, I'm a photographer, but you know the best way to describe or the best description I like of what I do? I'm not a photographer first, I'm a storyteller. How many like a good story? Yeah. How many prefer a lecture? Oh, you, you like lectures, okay. Well, I'm not gonna lecture today. I am going to tell you a story, and it's a story that many of you probably connect with. But over the years, I have been photographing Minnesota history, from old barns to churches to schoolhouses to old libraries, courthouses, old cabins. Along the way, driving the back roads in Minnesota, I began to notice another story in Minnesota. And that story is about what was being built back in the 1930s in what we call the Great Depression. How many remember those years? Some of you remember the Great Depression? Some of you were born during the Great Depression. Vern and I were talking, he was born in 1934, if you don't mind me saying. Now we know how old Vern is. <laughs> how many were born in the Great Depression? How many were born a little bit before the Depression? Okay, so those that even were born before the Depression, you're going to know this firsthand. And we're going to talk about that and what's standing today that was being built and developed. And it was a very interesting time in Minnesota and American history. Some people say it was one of the darkest hours of American history. Probably not as dark as the Civil War time, but a very challenging time in our history, wasn't it? But at the same time, there was a sense of optimism. And I always want to focus on the positive. Yes, there were struggles and challenges. How many remember some of the challenges during the Great Depression? And what were some of the challenges that you remember? Absolutely. Scarcity of food. Can you imagine that today? You got a bistro right out here. I could walk around the corner and probably get a cup of coffee and a donut, right? And so much food that gets thrown away. Yeah, Mary, you're right. But during the Depression years, there was challenges, and one of it was just having enough to get by your daily needs. But like I said, Optimism was also in the air during that time. How did we get to the Great Depression? We could go into all the politics that led up to it. And who really gets a lot of the blame for the Great Depression? How many know who that was? Mary? Herbert Hoover. Hoover. Did he make vacuums too? No. no. <laughs> Hoover. But you know what? I want to tell you this. I've done a lot of research in American history, especially presidential history, and Hoover certainly gets some of the blame. I'm not going to say he doesn't, but he gets too much of it, in my opinion. There were two presidents leading up to Hoover that began to drive us into the Great Depression before Hoover even took office in 1928. And who are the two presidents that preceded Hoover? Who? Who? Yeah, Warren G. Hardy wasn't in office very long. And Cool Cal. How many remember that term? Cool Cal. Calvin Coolidge. And like I said, I'm not going to get into the politics of the Great Depression, but at the same time, Hoover does get a lot of the blame. But I think he just happened to be in the place, and he had a philosophy 
that America can work their way out of the Great Depression by just leaving it alone. How many remember when historians believe the Great Depression actually started? Although it started much earlier, what was that year? 19 what? 1929, in October, the crash of the stock market. Remember hearing about that or reading about that? And Hoover was the president at that time. He didn't last very long, though, did he? He finished his term. And he ran for a second term against an, a new guy. And who was that guy? Roosevelt. FDR. We remember FDR? Well, he gets elected in a, in a complete landslide. I could have beat Hoover that year. You would have voted for me, right? But Hoover loses in, a, in an extreme landslide. Roosevelt gets elected in his inauguration speech in 1932. He tells the American people that I'm going to give you something. And what was that? Say it really loud. A new deal. Well, what about the old deal? Well, they've just lived through the old deal long enough. It was time for a new deal. And Roosevelt was in the spotlight with a vision to change America and improve the condition of Americans. Now, when, you, when I say improve the condition, do you know that in Minnesota, in 1932, unemployment was 29%. Now that's bad, but if you lived in the Iron Range of Minnesota in 1932, unemployment was 70%. 70% unemployment in the Iron Range in 1932. Like I said, I think any of us could have been elected when the conditions were that rough. Why would I want to re-elect Hoover? if seven out of 10 people are out of jobs. If you lived in Hibbing, for example. So Roosevelt gets elected, and I'm just giving you this background so we can get into the show with the pictures here in a minute. Roosevelt gets elected. Within the first 90 days, that spring of 1932, I think it was 32, maybe it's 33, but whatever, he gets going. And he starts a program. His baby is what he called it. And throughout the program today, I'm going to use these letters or acronyms that will depict these programs. How many have heard of the CCC? And what was the CCC? Civilian. You got it. You got it. Two thirds, right? Civilian. Conservation Corps. Roosevelt had a vision, and he was a conservationist. But his late uncle really started conservation in America, and who was that? Teddy Roosevelt. Do you know that Teddy Roosevelt started most of, during his era, started many of our national parks in, in America? So the Roosevelts, as a family, understood this whole push for conservation. So FDR becomes president in 32, and he starts this program with the emphasis on conservation. But he also knew that there was a big benefit to this program, and it would be putting men to work. We can go ahead and get the lights. Now, you're OK with me standing over here? We're good. Awesome. How many had a family member or knew somebody in the CCCs? Anybody? And who was it? You don't remember who it was? Some, in your family? How, you knew somebody around your home? Your uncle was in the CCCs. Do you remember where and how he served? He served at the Okay. Absolutely. So he worked out west in the national park system. Anyone else remember? Yes. A cousin. A cousin. And where did he work? Do you recall? I don't remember. 
Yeah. Well, the CCC program was Roosevelt's first conservation drive in America. And you know what? It didn't employ the numbers that his later programs will employ, like the WPA. But the CCC's was kind of his baby. And the CCC's got young men involved, but they had to meet a certain criteria to become one of the boys of the CCC. The first criteria is you had to come from a family that was on relief. Remember that term relief? What do we call it today? We call it welfare. But in those days, welfare wasn't the word we used. We used the word relief. And you had to come from a family on relief. And most of the boys from the CCCs came from urban neighborhoods. The gal in the back said we lived on a farm. So we had plenty of food. Most of the boys did not come from farms. They came from urban environments, from neighborhoods in South Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, suburbs of Minneapolis. They came from probably right around Lake Minnetonka. So you had to come from a family on relief. And you had to weigh over 105 pounds. If you weighed less than 105, you couldn't join. Do you know that some boys didn't even weigh 105 pounds? We talk about lack of food. A lot of young boys in the 30s were underweight because they just didn't have enough food. I love this statue in Gooseberry Falls State Park of the boys of the CCC. Do you know that the average weight of a CCC boy was 119 pounds? That was a, and we're talking an 18 year old to 22 year old young man, 119 pounds. I don't remember when I was 119 pounds. And look at that statue. That guy looks about 160 and totally built, ready to, to conquer the world. But that really isn't a true depiction of a young boy in the CCCs. Hungry, small, but it didn't take long because the CCC boys were recruited and within the first six weeks, an average weight gain of 28 pounds. Six weeks, 28 pounds. How many would like to gain 28 pounds in the next six weeks? <laughs> You'd rather go the other way, right? Imagine eating potatoes, as many as you can eat all day long. That'll do it for you, right? As much bread as you want. And they did, they gained weight. Okay, so you're a boy in the CCCs, you get selected to join this work program. And this work program was designed for two major purposes in America. And in Minnesota, we had about 80,000, I'm sorry, maybe it wasn't quite that many, there's probably about uh, uh, 60,000 boys in the CCCs. Now think about that for a minute. What are you gonna do? What was the focus of the, this program? It was really two focuses. One was on planting trees. That's why it gets a nickname. It was called Roosevelt's Tree Army. You know, in America, over two billion trees were planted during the 1930s. Now think about that, over two billion, with a B. In Minnesota, millions of trees were planted. Go up in northern Minnesota, Chippewa National Forest, Superior National Forest, and you will see forests, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, about how the boys planted these trees, and we enjoy them today. What was the second focus? If you lived in southern Minnesota, down by New Ulm, who, who mentioned New Ulm? Mary did. And what was their focus? It wasn't to plant trees. It was to help farmers with soil erosion. Port Ridgely State Park, for example, was a CCC camp and it helped farmers. How many remember that term in the, in the 30s? It was called the dirty 30s. Remember that term? The dirty 30s? Heard that? Vern, have you heard that? Where'd that come from? the Dust Bowl. You know that farmers needed help in 
plowing a certain way to prevent the topsoil from being lost. Now, we weren't technically in the Dust Bowl in Minnesota, but if you lived down in the panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, you were in the heart of the Dust Bowl. You can't tell people that lived down in southern Minnesota during the 30s that they didn't have dust, believe me. I've read many accounts and talked to many seniors that said, oh, it was incredibly dusty. Does anyone remember the dust and the dirt of the 30s? That's why we get the term, the dirty 30s. So the boys, let me get my pointer down here so I can advance the slides. But most of the boys in Minnesota actually went to uh, work up in northern Minnesota. And they went to camps. You know that when you enrolled in the CCCs, it was a six-month enrollment? A commitment of six months. And you built roads. You built state parks. You planted trees. You did a lot of jobs. And it paid really well, didn't it? No, <laughs> it didn't. You know how much it paid? A dollar a day. Okay, so $30 a month. And you know what you had to do with your $30? You had to send 25 of it home to your folks. The whole idea of this program was to help not only the young boy or young man, but to help families. And I've read accounts that uh, a family had two boys of age and they both went in and they would get $50 a month. And back in those days, $50 a month helped the rest of the family pay their mortgage, buy their groceries. They survived because of the money sent home. How many think we should do a program like that again? I wish my son would join. Send 25 home. How many have kids that send money home? <laughs> Probably not. But back in those days, they did. And you can see the young men, and you look in this picture here, they're working on a road up in northern Minnesota, and you'll see some older guys there too. Now, the older men, older than age 22, we call them LEMs, local experienced men. You can't put a bunch of 18, 19 year old boys out on a work crew and expect them to get the job done without a foreman. So what did they do? They hired older men that were out of work, but had experience in road construction, in forestry, in truck driving, and all the things that the older men would have, they would help the young men on the, on the crews. So when you join, you joined just like you were in the service. How many here served in the military? We got some service. Thank you for your service. And, and it was just like the military. You went down to Fort Snelling to sign up. And you went through the whole process. How many remember that process where you, had to, you got your uniforms and then you got your shots? They always used a square needle, didn't they? <laughs> right, Paul? They used a square needle for the shots. Yeah, it seemed like it, right? And the boys talk about being inducted at Fort Snelling. They got their boots, one size, for everybody, large, didn't matter, right? Then you're put on a bus, or maybe the train, and you're sent to northern Minnesota. And you don't even know the boys that you're with, and you go to this camp. And for the next six months, you live out in the woods. Five bucks you get to spend a month. And what did you use your spending money for? Maybe cigarettes, candy, pop. Maybe some postage stamps to send love letters home to your girlfriend. And do you know that, uh, and then you live, well, you lived in these camps just like the military. And in northern Minnesota, there's a couple of these camps still standing today. I walked into this one. This was way up in Lake of the Woods County, almost to Roseau, way up there, about as far away as you can get in Minnesota. 
And it was like walking back into time. Living in these barracks. Paul, you remember the barracks? Were you in the army? Oh, yeah. yeah, you remember that was, sure. A lot of privacy, too. You get your own room. No. No privacy here, right? Do you know what the biggest problem that the boys had when they first arrived at the camp? What do you think the biggest issue would be? Homesickness. You pull a kid off the sidewalk in North Minneapolis and you put him with a bunch of new guys he doesn't even know. He's never been away from home. And he goes up somewhere on the Iron Range or maybe up in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, out in the woods, doesn't know a soul. And maybe he's a little quiet by nature. Homesickness. And do you know that some of the boys actually ran away from the camps to get home? They'd rather have the conditions, even though they had all the food they wanted to eat, the conditions and were good, you know, comparable, but they were homesick. I love the old cook stove still out there by this old barracks. This is a camp up by Bemidji. It was like it was left just hours before I arrived. I love the basin. And speaking of privacy, probably not, right? There you go. How do you like that for camp life, folks? No. There was an adjustment period, I'm sure, for a lot of the boys. But, you know, homesickness lasted maybe a week or two. Pretty soon, the commandant at the camp basically said, you know what, get involved in something. We got a camp band. You play the accordion or the harmonica? We need a accordion player. We got an old accordion. Pretty soon that young boy is in the band making friends. We're starting a baseball team at the camp. We're going to play another camp a few miles away on Saturday afternoon. Pretty soon homesickness is gone. But during the week, they were there to work. Now, when the boys signed up, three government agencies operated to get this whole program going for Roosevelt. Can you imagine three government agencies working together today? <laughs> Probably not, right? The Department of Labor hired them. The War Department, we call that the Department of Defense today, but that was called the War Department back then, took care of inducting them, giving them their shots, giving them their uniforms. And the Department of the Interior decided what projects they needed done. So three government agencies cooperating to help this program get off the ground. But tree planting was the main emphasis for Minnesota. Like I said, millions of trees are planted in northern Minnesota. If you go to northern Minnesota today and you see a pine tree, a spruce, a white pine, a red pine, maybe even a red cedar, and it's about the size between a medium and a large pizza. We all know that size, right? Chances are it was planted by the boys of the CCC. This is in Itasca State Park, white spruce. During the 1930s, we call them the dirty 30s because it was very dry and very um, arid throughout America. Forest fires were rampant. And the US Forest Service couldn't keep up fighting fires. So do you know what? They hired the camps, or the camps helped the Forest Service, and the boys went out and they fought fires. They weren't trained firefighters, but they could dig a ditch, a fire break. They could help construct a fire tower. And in Minnesota, we had over 75 fire towers constructed during the 1930s 
by the boys of the CCC. This one's in St. Croix State Park. How many have ever climbed a fire tower? Those are fun, aren't they? Which ones did you climb? You were on the one in St. Croix? That, that's a tall one for sure. Do you remember which fire tower you climbed? Uh, I was in New England. I don't know. Okay, you, out in New England you, you, you climbed them. Yeah. You know, today there's a few fire towers you can still climb. How many like to take a field trip? We could all get on a bus or van and we could go climb some fire towers. Just like the 1930s. And they helped fire the U.S. Forest Service fight the fires in northern Minnesota. The boys would actually be told to go up and be fire watch guys at the top of the tower. They would spend all day in round the clock shifts. Sometimes you'd have the night shift. And you would look out with binoculars looking for fires, grabbing your cell phone and calling it in. No, that meant climbing down the stairs, getting in your Jeep or your truck, driving to a nearby phone, calling it in. Yes? No, no, um, you would never make a fire tower out of wood for obvious reasons, right? If you put it in an area and your fire is starting down below you, you want to make sure that that <laughs> isn't going to burn up, right? No, they're made out of metal. They were also involved in state parks. You know that our state parks doubled in size in terms of our numbers during the 1930s due to two programs, the CCCs and the WPA. Itasca State Park is our oldest state park in Minnesota. How many have been to Itasca? It's a great park, isn't it? But it wasn't started in the 30s, but it was developed. A lot of its infrastructure was built during the 1930s. It's our oldest state park. It was started in 1891. Anybody here remember 1891? How many think some mornings they feel like they should? Right. No, 1891. It was started as our first state park. Today we have 67 state parks. But we doubled our number in the Great Depression. If you've been to Itasca State Park, you're going to notice uh, a lot of buildings. This is my favorite building in Minnesota because it's named after me. It's called the Douglas Lodge. They named it after me. No. But they, this is the style of architecture that was being built in the 1930s. They called it rustic architecture. The Forest Inn. Beautiful building at Itasca, all built by hand by the boys of the CCC. And look at the, the stone, look at the log construction. And go inside and look at the big fireplaces and, and the beams. It's just beautiful. But that's my favorite structure at Itasca. Look at that. Old growth forest. How many know we don't have trees like that very often? You don't see those in Minnesota anymore. But why do people go to Lake Itasca State Park? What is the main reason we go there? Walk across the river to the headwaters. Headwaters of the Rum River? <laughs> headwaters of what river? The mighty Mississippi, right? And do you know that? If you've walked across, and how many have done that? How many know that those rocks were not put there by the last glacier 10,000 years ago? <laughs> those rocks were placed there intentionally by the boys of the CCC. They're all cemented in. I know, that disappoints you now. You're thinking, I thought they were natural. They're not. There was a large camp, one of the, actually the second camp in Minnesota at a state park it was Itasca. A large CCC camp, about 250 boys. All the trail systems, the fire towers, the tree planting, the buildings, uh, all the construction were done by the boys. And that camp stayed open from about 1934 to about 1940. So about six or almost seven years, Itasca State Park camp was open. 
Yeah, they're always slippery, for sure. But the earliest CCC camp in Minnesota, at a state park, was north of Grand Rapids, called Scenic State Park. How many have heard of Scenic State Park? It's way up north of Grand Rapids. And it's a beautiful park, because it's really remote. And this building here, this log and stone construction, is, is a great, great example. And it's like it was built yesterday. It's so well done. We just don't build that like that anymore. Go inside the building. Big stone fireplace. <clears throat> the murals painted in there depicting a forest fire. There was a local boy who learned how to paint at the Minnesota or the Minneapolis Institute of Art before he joined. He was a painter. And there's three paintings depicting a forest in Minnesota. The first one, and they're larger. Murals are, they're larger than the, oh, they're probably about the size of the screen. And they're in this building. They're amazing. And the three paintings, here's the first one, showing a forest before a forest fire, during a forest fire. And what happens to a forest after a forest fire. But you know, a forest fire, as we know, can be a really healthy thing for a forest, can't it? It burns all the undergrowth. Some of the bigger trees stay, and it kind of cleans it out. And I like the fact that, look, he put little flowers starting the regrowth of a forest. It's a healthy thing. But I love the paintings, and you'll find those at Scenic State Park. Another state park that the CCC was involved with is Jay Cook. How many have been to Jay Cook State Park? It's up by Duluth. Their famous swinging bridge was built by the CCCs. You know that this is bridge number five, and now today we have bridge number six. We've lost five bridges in its history. The St. Louis River has washed out five bridges. And every year, or every time they wash it out, they raise it higher and higher. Here's a building. This is the uh, visitor center today called the River Inn. This is at Jay Cook. But what I want you to notice about this building is the stonework. Very hard stone to work with. It's called uh, Duluth Gabbro. It's quarried uh, up by Duluth. But look at how well it's constructed. The boys in the CCC left us a legacy. And that legacy is in these old buildings. One of my favorite parks to see the work of the New Deal is at Gooseberry Falls. How many have been to Gooseberry Falls? Mary, you've been to a lot of parks. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. And this is the, uh, uh, the old, uh, well, when I remember that, that was a little country store or a little uh, souvenir store right on Highway 61. Back in the day, you could actually park on the highway and go in there and buy a candy bar or an ice cream cone or a little souvenir of your trip to the North Shore. Today it's closed, but that was built. And look at how the rock color is different. Much different than Jay Cook, because it was rock that was quarried in different locations. So they would always use material that was close by. And they hired blacksmiths to do all the hardware work. This is called Castle Wall. This is the wall that runs along parallel with Highway 61 as you're driving to the bridge to overlook uh, Gooseberry Falls. And it's the largest wall that was built by the CCCs in America. And it's called the Castle Wall. And like I said, it's got two different colors stones. One's kind of a red stone. And the other one, they call it blue. It doesn't really look blue to me, but they call it blue. And it's two different stones. One was quarried near St. Scholastica College in Duluth, and the other one was by Beaver Bay. And the men built the wall, and you know how they built it? They had a stonemason there, kind of one of those LEMs, local experienced men. He was the foreman, but the boys had to actually take the measurement of the space they needed the rock cut for. 
And how they did that, they didn't use a tape measure, they used a coat hanger. And they would bend it to the shape they needed that rock to be. They would bring that down to the stonemason, who was down below with his chisel and his jackhammers. And what if, he, what if the boys got it wrong? It didn't fit. So then they'd discard that rock and hope they could find another space for it later. And then the foreman would get mad at the boys for doing it wrong. They learned real quick, use that coat hanger and measure correctly. But that was all done by a coat hanger. Another, this is called the Lady Slipper Lodge. This is in Gooseberry. What I want you to notice in this picture is that large stone to the right of the entryway. Look at the size of that thing. I would have put that down low. Why'd they put it so high? You know? But it's amazing, uh, the stonework in this building. We're down uh, at Fort Ridgely where this is down by New Alm. And what's neat about this park is it's a historic park, but it was built, a lot of it was built after um, the fort basically closed and, and then it became a state park, one of the oldest ones in Minnesota. In fact, it's the third oldest state park. And uh, that building there at Fort Ridgely was built by the CCCs um, as a replica of the commissary of the old fort. The shops at Fort Ridgely, this is behind the park. Most people don't see this part of the park when they're there to visit. The picnic shelters. I love the drinking fountains at state parks. Have you ever noticed a drinking fountain? They're really, they're going to last forever. How many know where Whitewater State Park is? Down by Rochester. Another CCC camp. Here's the uh, picnic shelter there at Whitewater. Now look at the stone color. It's quite different than what you saw at Gooseberry or Jay Cook. Right? Because down in southeastern Minnesota, we have limestone. And limestone was the material available and much easier to work with. It was softer stone. You could, you could cut it and carve it much easier. Love the drinking fountain here. Of all the state parks in Minnesota, if you want to see structures built during the 1930s, go to this park and you won't have to go to any others. St. Croix State Park has over 70 buildings in that park, all built by the CCCs. This is right outside of New Ulm. This is the uh, uh, park called Flandreau State Park. And it's very German. How many know that New Ulm is very German? And today, you can go to Flandreau and you can see some of the structures. They're very German in its style. But what I like about it, their barracks are still there from the, from the camp, much like northern Minnesota. But what's interesting about this barracks and this camp, it was uh, used after the New Deal programs were over, and it was used in 1944 and 1945. Why would we use it back during those years? Any idea? This was a German POW camp. Now think about that for a minute. You're a German soldier, it's at, toward the tail end of World War II. The American armies cross the Rhine and going into Germany. The Russians are on the doorstep coming from the east. And you're a German soldier being pinched. Who do you want to surrender to, the Russian army or the American army? What would happen if you would have surrendered to the Russian army? Where would you have been sent? Probably to Siberia to a gulag and never be heard from again. But you were fortunate, you surrendered to an American unit. And they sent you to New Ulm, Minnesota. Now think about that. It's like going to a spa. 
vacation, a club med. Everybody speaks your language. 179 men, I believe, was the total number that stayed the last six months of World War II in these barracks. What did they do? They worked for local farmers. There was a labor shortage of men. They also worked for local canning factories. And if you were one of the lucky few selected, you worked at Shell's Brewery in New Ulm. I surrender, right? I'd put both hands up, I'd be ready to go. On Friday nights, the commandant of the camp let you go into town and watch movies, where you met the local girls. You know, after the war was over, State Department required everybody to go home to their home country, but some of them later moved back to New Ulm. Because again, they had met local families and their relatives are there today in a CCC camp at a state park. I like the story. Besides state parks, they built wayside rest. How many remember taking driving vacations when you were younger and you would stop at a wayside rest and have a picnic? You didn't go to a restaurant, you packed a basket, right? You pulled into these wonderful wayside rests today and a few of them are still around, although we're losing many of them. This is near, this is on the North Shore near Cascade Falls, up by Grand Marais. This one's up north of Virginia, up by a little town called Orr. How many have heard of the town called Orr? This is on Pelican Lake, you can see it in the background. Built by a CCC camp. The plaque is there. When you're up driving around, look for signs and little plaques like this, and we'll remind you of what the boys did and its beautiful craftsmanship. How many wish we had summer again? <laughs> Even with dandelions. I'll take them, right? But look at that beautiful concourse wayside rest. Built in the 1930s, still today, as solid and strong as the day it was built. But the one that you probably, many of you remember the most, might be this one. What town am I in on this one? Anyone know where we're at with the big walleye? How many have heard of Garrison, Minnesota? Up on Lake Mille Lacs. This is the largest wayside rest in Minnesota built by the CCCs. They've done a whole remodel now because the erosion from Lake Mille Lacs was starting to undercut the concourse. They've since fixed that but I was hired to go out and take pictures of the damage. I went out in my kayak and got this picture on a windy day on Lake Mille Lacs. Here's one that's kind of left abandoned and not taken care of. This is up by St. Cloud. How many of you remember driving down Highway 100 in St. Louis Park and Golden Valley and remember Lilac Drive? They had all those structures, picnic structures, in the boulevard, all built during the 1930s. When people would travel, and again, not stop at Dairy Queen or Taco Bell or McDonald's, they'd stop and have a picnic. We need to do that more often, I think, don't you think? Have picnics again. There was another organization started during the same time as the CCCs, just a little bit after, and it didn't last very long, but it had the letters VCC. What was VCC? It was an extension of the CCC, but who was it for? Veterans, Veterans exactly. The Veterans Conservation Corps. Veterans of what? World War I. Out of work. The World War I veterans had made that big protest during the Hoover administration in Washington. How many remember that term, Hooverville? And Hoover called the National Guard out and basically tear gassed them and water hosed them off of the, the mall in Washington. What did they do when they protested under Roosevelt? Roosevelt put them to work. That was the difference. The VCC 
made an impact primarily in one state park in Minnesota. If you're ever up in central Minnesota near Wilmer, there's a park north of Wilmer called Sibley State Park, named after our first governor. It's up by New London. And this is built by the VCC. This is the bathrooms. This plaque is dedicated to the members of World War I Veterans Conservation Corps Company 1785, who again served their country during the Great Depression by constructing Sibley State Park's historic stone buildings for the enjoyment of future generations. That's us, folks. Future generations. And we can go out and enjoy the park because of what they did. My favorite building at Sibley State Park, there's a number of them, but I love this one. They even well, here, let me, before I get to that, let me show you this picture. Here's some of the men working at Sibley State Park. They're older men. But I love this building here. The fish cleaning building. Well, we need a building to clean our fish, right? It's on the shores of Lake Andrew. And that's the fish cleaning building built by the VCC. There was one other organization that was a connection to the, v, uh, to the CCC. It was called the NYA. What was the NYA? Some of you might have been involved in it, maybe. The National Youth Administration. 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. Families that needed little extra income. Summer jobs during the 1930s. This is the only building remaining in Minnesota that was contributed or built by the NYA, young kids. Supervised, of course. It's at Lake Bemidji State Park. And it's a beautiful building. And these kids didn't live in camps like the boys of the CCC. They lived in homes and towns, and they would be bussed out to the work site every day during the summer. What do you think the biggest job of the NYA was in Minnesota? What do you think their biggest responsibility or job was? Eradication of poison ID. Imagine that job. They put tanks on their backs with spray hoses and walking the trails of Itasca State Park, Lake Bemidji State Park and others, spraying to keep down the poison ivy along the trails for the people to enjoy. I even see poison ivy in a book, and I get it. <laughs> Can you imagine that job? How many get poison ivy? Yeah, some of you do. I do. Some people can walk over it and touch it, and it doesn't affect them at all. But I'm definitely allergic to poison ivy. So I, that wouldn't have been a good job for me. But the NYA helping families by letting their younger kids go to work. Just got a few more minutes. I just want to talk about another program called the WPA. What does the WPA stand for? Works Progress Administration. Good job. That's exactly what it is. The Works Progress Administration. What was the difference between the WPA and the CCCs? Big difference. Anybody know? Do you know that WPA both men and women were involved in that one, where the CCC was all men. But the WPA had probably a third of them were ladies working in the projects. And what did they do? Now, the ladies didn't live in the camps, but the WPA had camps, much like the CCC, like this one here at Lake Bronson State Park, way up in northwestern Minnesota. But the WPA did much, much more than just state parks. Um, that camp, by the way, is an open field today. You can go visit it today at Lake Bronson. And their biggest project up at Lake Bronson was to build the Lake Bronson Dam. And this dam is the largest WPA project built in Minnesota. In fact, the WPA was a national project. And the largest WPA project in America was also a dam. Anyone know which one? It wasn't Hoover. It wasn't, they would have never named a dam Hoover. Oh, okay. Oh, what are the names? Uh, that was built before. <laughs> but what was the largest dam built? 
in America today by the WPA. It was the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington. But the Lake Bronson Dam took 300 men and women to construct this dam. Still there today. The water tower at Lake Bronson. The WPA hired many more people than the CCCs. It was a much bigger program, and it paid more money. I believe the pay was $56 a month. And you could keep it. You didn't have to send it home, because you were the home. Okay. What other projects did the WPA work on? They did state parks, and I'll show you a few of those. This is Old Mill State Park, again, the uh, water tower. And my favorite structure at Old Mill State Park, this is the picnic shelter, is this bridge. Beautiful, beautiful construction at Old Mill State Park. This is near New Folden, Minnesota, north of Thief River Falls. But look at the stone construction. It's a beautiful work of art. Other state parks that they got involved with, this is Camden State Park down by Marshall. This is all WPA now. Drinking fountain, I'll just rapidly go through. They were at Miniopa State Park down by Mankato. Uh, built, uh, uh, this is the waterfall at Miniopa State Park. They built the nature center there. They built water erosion dams. This is the dam site at uh, Blue Mound State Park, down by Laverne. They built this bridge over the Split Rock uh, River, down in southwestern uh, Minnesota. Beautiful bridge, by the way. You ever been to Little Falls? Who was the famous Little Falls resident? Lindbergh. Lindbergh. And there's a state park named after Lindbergh, and this is the Lindbergh State Park, but it's named after his dad. It's not named after the aviator. A little trivia for you. His dad was a politician. Here's the water tower at Lindbergh State Park. At St. Croix, or this is at Interstate State Park at Taylor's Falls. Again, the big fireplaces. Very similar to the CCCs, but a little bit better work. Older people were working on them, not the young kids. So the workmanship is a little bit more refined. Before I move off, this, off state parks, this is at Lake Carlos State Park. How many think they know what that uh, little porch area is off of this building is? What do you think that was made for? This is a beach changing bathrooms and whatever along the lake. What do you think they built that little patio area for? How many have ever been to the beach and you got sand on your feet? You wish you didn't have to put your shoes and socks on when the sand is stuck between your toes. You sit on the edge there and there's little water spigots that come out and you wash your feet and you put your shoes on. They thought of everything, right? Lock of Parle State Park out by Montevideo. They even built a diorama depicting the Minnesota River Valley. This is all WPA built. They did a lot of other things too. They weren't only involved in state parks, they built libraries. This is the last WPA project built in Minnesota. This is at Cass Lake. 1943, the program was over. They built auditoriums. This is at Deerwood, Minnesota, 1936. The gymnasium floor, I love the high gloss wax. How many can just hear the basketballs bouncing on the floor? The auditorium in Beardsley, Minnesota. They built stadiums like this one in International Falls. Sports stadium. I love the depiction of the men or the football players. They don't look 119 pounds, do they? They were bigger than life. How many have seen these signs with the eagle? They were plaques that were put on projects all over Minnesota, in fact, all over America. 
They built infrastructure in county fairgrounds. This is at the Olmstead County Fair in Rochester, this building. They built auditoriums and they built stadiums and they built grandstands at, at county fairgrounds. This is in the town of Blue Earth, Faribault County. They built schools, Jasper, Minnesota. They built another school in Jackson, Minnesota. They built con uh, courthouse concourses, these walls, these retaining walls. Long Prairie, Minnesota, Todd County. They did paintings. WPA did surveys. How many have ever walked sidewalks in Minneapolis and looked down in the corner of the sidewalk and seen this little stamp called WPA in the sidewalk? You don't find them very much anymore, they've been replaced, but uh, on some neighborhood streets in Minneapolis, they still have the original WPA sidewalks. They taught art classes. They, taught, they tutored students. That's where a lot of the ladies got involved. They did sewing projects. The WPA, thousands and thousands of Minnesotans were involved in the WPA. Anybody have a relative that was involved in a WPA project? You remember one? I don't have a relative, but it's true that the 1938 addition to the local high school was a WPA project. Yeah. It was the stadium structure. That's awesome. This painting mural is painted on the post office wall when you walk in in International Falls, Minnesota. And real quick, I know I've gone a little bit long, and I apologize for that, but we want to include one more organization, real quick. How many have heard of the PWA? Not the WPA, the PWA. Have you heard of that? Public Works Administration. What was the difference between the PWA and the WPA? The PWA hired companies to do projects, where the WPA hired you, and you, and you, you didn't know each other, but you all worked on the same projects together. You got to know each other, but you didn't work for a company. You were an individual hired and selected for the program. The PWA said all four of you ladies all work for Honeywell. We're going to hire Honeywell to build our school or to build or to do whatever or a construction company. You all belong to that. You all come to do the project. That was the difference. So companies were elected to work on projects. What are some of the projects they built? Midway Airport in Chicago. A PWA project, one of the largest ones in northern Minnesota, the Hibbing Auditorium. That was PWA. Famous dignitaries from Bill Clinton to Bob Dylan to George Bush have spoken in the Hibbing Auditorium. Maybe even Jesse Ventura. How many went to see him? They built only one library in Minnesota, in Elbow Lake. And they're proud of that fact in Elbow Lake. They're, they love the fact that they have the only PWA library in all of Minnesota. And I'm going to conclude with two pictures. This one and the next one. This is a PWA building that was built. It's one of my favorite structures in all of Minnesota, in the little town of Barrett, Minnesota. It's called the Roosevelt Hall. What's the name of the town? Barrett. Barrett, with a B. And do you know what the PWA also did? Help farmers, and there was crews and companies that went out and helped local farmers building outhouses. True story. They built over 250,000 outhouses in America. That's where we get the brick outhouse jokes. In conclusion to the program, folks, and I'll, I'll take some questions if anyone has them. You know, the, the 1930s was a challenging time, but it was also, like I said earlier, an optimistic time. And we got through it, didn't we? Because we're hardy Americans. We got through it because the programs that Roosevelt put out were not a handout. The men and women involved in, the, in these programs worked for every dime they earned. It wasn't a free check that you could sit at home and watch TV. I'm going to give you a check, but you're going to go plant trees. 
You're going to go fight fires, and you're going to build an auditorium. But you're going to earn it. And I think that's a good thing. And I think, you know what it did for, for America? Not only it got us through the Depression, but what I think the biggest impact of the 1930s was what happened just recently, just a couple of days ago, we celebrated or remembered the anniversary of something in America. What was it? Pearl Harbor, right? And during that time that led us into World War II, guess who went to the battlefields or who worked at home in the munition plants and the factories were the men and women that cut their teeth by building things here in Minnesota. Planting trees, building auditoriums, building bathrooms or outhouses. And they fought two wars. Basically, World War II was two enemies and one because of the training. Do you think the boys in the CCC understood military life when they were called to serve? Absolutely they understood it. Because they had worked in the northern Minnesota forest, working and living in barracks, working with men that they didn't even know, got along. And do you know what? That training served them well. So you can say whatever you want about the political side of the New Deal and Roosevelt's plan, but I can tell you this that I think it helped America not only get through the Great Depression, but it helped them win World War II. Like I said earlier, there was a sense of optimism. And the last thing I'll say is this. The newspaper for the CCCs, the national newspaper, you know what its title was? Happy Days. Now think about that for a minute. In one of the darkest hours of American history, the newspaper is called Happy Days because we were going to get through it. But thank you again, and I thank Vern and, and the group here uh, for having me, and I hope you've enjoyed the program today. Thank you.